Dear friends, greetings to you in Jesus almighty name and it gives me great joy to reach out to you all through this program just beyond the horizon science faith dialogue. Today I will be dealing with a topic titled the virgin birth of Jesus biblical and scientific look. Now when we look at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the virgin birth is very important. There are many people who are not willing to understand that Jesus was born of a virgin. So let us look at it scientifically as well as biblically to know that Jesus was born of a virgin. The virgin birth of Jesus, biblical and scientific look. Years back my wife and I went to Israel and we visited Bethlehem and there is a beautiful church called Church of Nativity. This basilica has the shape of a cross. It is 170 feet long and 80 feet wide. And the word of God says, unto you is born this day a savior in Bethlehem named Jesus, Luke 2, 11. Now when we look at the place of Jesus' birth, if you read Luke's Gospel, 2nd chapter, 7th verse, Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Jesus was not born in a manger. The word of God says, Mary brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now it is assumed that Jesus was born in a cave. This cave that is in the particular place where the church has been built. The cave is of rectangular shape, 35 into 10 feet and a silver star with a Latin inscription, His De Maria Virgine, Jesus Christus not set. That is here, Jesus Christ was born of Virgin Mary. This particular place has been designated as a place where Jesus was born, but the manger is near that. Manger is near that. So I would rather say that Jesus was born maybe on a street under a tree. There is no place for them in the inn. Now we visited Cairo, Old Cairo. There is a church called St. Sergius Church and the Holy Crypt, Old Cairo, Egypt. When you look at Matthew's Gospel, 2nd chapter, 13th verse, Now when the wise men had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When we visited this particular church, I was deeply moved. Within the church, there are a few steps that go down into a crypt. The crypt where Jesus and Mary and Joseph had stayed. It is said that the crypt would be flooded up with water when river Nile would be in spate. So when I thought about that, I was deeply moved. Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Mary and Joseph and Jesus had to flee to Egypt as the Lord God guided them. Now when you look at the places where Mary, Jesus and Joseph stayed, there is a house where baby Jesus had stayed in Cairo. An old house is there and I, I show it in this slide. Later, God guided Joseph to bring Jesus and Mary to Nazareth and there is a church built over the carpentry shed at Nazareth. Now, let us look at the prophecy of Isaiah in the Old Testament about the virgin birth of Jesus. There are 300 prophecies that speak about Jesus' event. Jesus' event means the prophecies about Jesus, the birth of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus and the uh, ministry of Jesus and his death and resurrection and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost. It is Jesus' event, the whole thing. So there are 300 prophecies that speak about Jesus' event in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the New Testament. Isaiah, who lived between 740 and 680 BC prophecy, as we read in Isaiah 7th chapter 14th verse, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. The concept of virgin birth of Jesus Christ has been subject of conflicting opinions among theologians. Let us look at this concept in a balanced, beneficial, biblical, spiritual and scientific way. Some liberal theologians contend that this verse in Isaiah speaks about a girl, not necessarily a virgin. Not necessarily a virgin. The Greek translation used the word Parthenos, which means a virgin, in Hebrew it is Alama, virgin. And it was referred by Matthew in his gospel, Matthew's gospel, first chapter, 
22nd and 23rd verse if you read. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. This has been of enormous importance in Christian interpretative tradition. Theologians who follow historical criticism or as they call it higher criticism regard this as a misinterpretation. There is another type of interpretation it is called as reader response interpretation focuses on the reader and their experience. When we read the word of God it must change our lives. It must work in our own heart. So this is called as reader response approach. This approach is accepted it is perfectly proper way to read the text. I prefer reader response approach rather than higher criticism because it is I look at it as something that is destructive. I look at it as lower criticism, not higher criticism. It is lower criticism. The word of God says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This verse has personal connotation for us. Reader response. Isaiah 9 chapter 6 verse. Isaiah also added that unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. According to David E. Stewart, the Hebrew word Pele, translated wonderful, speaks only about God, expressing the wonder of God's acts of judgment and redemption. Can any human child born to a man and a woman be holy enough to receive all these names? No, never. The editor of the Modern Churchman explains about the parentage of Jesus that his mother was a virgin and that he had no human father. This view is derived from the nativity narratives in the opening chapters of Matthew and Luke. Both these Gospels were composed in their present form some years after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and both Matthew and Luke wrote about the Davidic descent of Jesus, the birth of Jesus at Bethlehem and his virgin birth. Liberal theologians have no right to question the inspired writings of the Gospel. Matthew was an eyewitness of Jesus and Luke was a close associate of eyewitnesses of Jesus. So it is imperative that we understand the word of God with reader response attitude. Moving on, let me speak to you about Matthew's view of the virgin birth of Jesus. If you read Matthew's gospel, first chapter verses 18 to 25. After Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. And as he thought about these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Thus, Fulfilling the prophecy, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Joseph did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph was a very great man and a gentleman who was able to take care of the Lord Jesus as he was born to Mary and as Jesus was growing in his own home. Now, Jesus knew who he was at the age of 12, at the age of 12, when Mary and Joseph and Jesus came to Jerusalem to participate in the feast of the Passover, as we read in Luke's Gospel, second chapter, after the Passover was over and they were going back to their own places, Mary and Joseph did not take Jesus with them. Mary and Joseph, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, and both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when Mary and Joseph came back to Jerusalem temple after three days, they saw Jesus sitting with the priest there in the temple. Mary asked Jesus, why did you do this to us, your parents? And Jesus said, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Jesus knew who was his father. Jesus knew his identity. He had self-cognition, 
self understanding self definition so jesus knew who he was and the word of god says that he was able to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with god and man now when we look at joseph he was a person who had thoughtful prayers and prayerful thoughts usually at the age of betrothal for girls in israel it was 12 years and the consummation of marriage occurred within a year mary would have been 12 or 13 years of age when she was betrothed to joseph the gospels fail to record any words spoken by joseph but he was a thinker he had thoughtful prayers and prayerful thoughts that made him understand the supernatural act of god andrew t lincoln department of humanities university of gloucester uk said matthew writing the genealogy of jesus the genesis of jesus the messiah highlights the following the phrase joseph the son of david legitimizes that jesus is in the davidic line enabling his adoption into the family mary was his mother and also confirms that joseph was not his biological father so this is what we understand uh, about joseph he was a man with thoughtful prayers and prayerful thoughts let us look at luke's view of the virgin birth of jesus uh, let me read to you luke's gospel first chapter verses 26 to 13 and if you read luke had received the truth of jesus event from eye witnesses and it was most surely believed among the believers in the early church he declared that he had perfect understanding of all things from the very first the angel told mary as uh, luke writes rejoice highly favored one the lord is with you blessed are you among women do not be afraid mary for you have found favor with god and behold you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name jesus and he will be great and will be called the son of the highest mary had a question how can this be since i did not know a man and the angel replied the holy spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you therefore also that holy one who is to be born will be called the son of god in this beautiful scene of annunciation when the angel gabriel visited mary mary replied and said behold the maid servant of the lord let it be to me according to your word handmaid is dule in greek meaning female slave when the angel spoke to mary she was fully yielded and she knew about the consequences but she was totally yielded let us look at view of john about the incarnation of jesus john the beloved disciple of jesus could lean on the chest and hear the heartbeat of the lord jesus he does not mention about the virgin birth of jesus he goes all the way back to the very beginning of creation if we read john's gospel first chapter verses 1 and 14 he declares in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth and of his fullness have all we received grace upon grace john confirms about the eternal sonship of jesus in his gospel now let us look at st paul's understanding of jesus the son of god if we read romans first chapter verses 3 and 4 concerning his son jesus christ our lord who was born of the seed of david according to the flesh and declared to be the son of god with the power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead this is what st paul wrote paul does not deal with the birth stories nor does he refer to them for him the crowning moment of jesus's sonship is not his birth nor his baptism but the power of his victory over death he declares that jesus was proved to be the son of god by the power of resurrection jesus was the virgin born son of god proved the same with resurrection let us look at theologians views about the virginal birth of jesus let me just tell you something about karl barth his view the virgin birth functions as a fitting theological sign of the mystery of god's free grace of incarnation the beginning of a knowledge of god is not beginning which we can make with god it can be only the beginning which god has made with us the concept of virgin birth is derived exegetically that is understanding the basic meaning from the biblical text and is not a theological decision according to karl bath pneumatology the virgin birth remains sui generis something that happens once in a lifetime sui generis and functions as a pattern for and a heuristic tool to interpret 
the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of those who perceive and receive Jesus Christ as the reconciler of the world and therefore as the reconciler. So this is the view that we understand from Karl Barth. And let me read what Davis and Allison speak about Jesus' birth. They assert that Joseph knew that Mary was conceived miraculously by the Holy Spirit. From this, the early Christians came to associate the Holy Spirit with the conception. Moving on, let me tell something about the view of Raymond E. Brown. He said, Matthew and Luke definitely assert virginal conception of Mary. He also assumes that the language through the Holy Spirit rules out any human agent in the conception and argues that the manner of begetting is creative rather than sexual. Virginal conception was an external reaction of God's creative power as unique as the initial creation. Moving on, let me tell something about the view of Witherington III. He pointed out that we can maintain the virginal conception as a theological idea. The virginal conception shows how Jesus could be born with human nature without original sin. This is very important. Jesus was born with human nature without original sin. Now, let me tell you something about Bultmann. He opined that modern men simply cannot believe in miracles of the Bible and infants and narratives are legends. When such people fail to believe the truth, they become the lo losers. Jane Schauber, a lady, she has written something very disturbing. According to this lady, the conception of Jesus followed the rape of Mary and communicates the theological message that God God siding with the wronged woman has made her child the son of God. She is more concerned about feministic ideas rather than the word of God. Is it not ridiculous and blasphemous? Suppose if God had to choose a man, born of a man and a woman, to be the savior of mankind, he would have chosen Joseph, son of J Jacob, or maybe Daniel. These men kept their lives clean and holy before God. But God knew what he was doing. Now, my response to the liberal theologians. For salvation of humans, no human can offer himself as a sacrifice because all humans have sinful nature. God foreknew about human fall and had made the provision in his eternal son even before the foundations of this world. These theologians have their own different views. Some of the theologians look at the issue only from an academic point of view, using their brain only and fail to look at it through the Holy Spirit. They are the losers. Let us look at the view of Mary and Joseph. Two important people that are involved in this great divine initiation of salvation plan were fully convinced about the virgin birth. Joseph was convinced about the purity of Mary and the virgin birth. Mary also was convinced about the virgin birth. Then why should some of our theologians worry about it and then try to bring in their own views to pervert the gospel, pervert the word of God? This happens when the theologians use only their cerebral knowledge. Such people have no salvation experience. They do not wish to enter into reader response criticism. I have been exposed to the word of God. I have been reading God's word from my childhood and know about the living word as it has changed my life in a dramatic way. Let us look at virginal birth of Jesus from a scientific point of view. A logical question had been brought out by J.S. Wright. He commented that the virgin birth of Jesus is against the biological necessity of X and Y chromosomes. For a male child to be born, the Y chromosome found in man must be there. If Jesus was of virgin birth, why did the Y chromosome come? A logical question. Dr. Victor Pierce, when he spoke about creation of Adam and Eve, he said, man was made from cosmic dust. God spoke into DNA, used the enzymes to put the body parts together and biotic life was formed. God breathed into the nostril of Adam and he became a living soul, a personality. Now God caused deep sleep for Adam, like giving an anesthesia. Rib was taken. Rib in Sumerian language speaks about something that is circular, something, something that is round. I would say it is like a cell. After surgery, no stitches were I mean, put on the body of uh, Adam. Ligase and enzyme was used to glue the flesh according to Victor Pierce, Adam had 46 chromosomes, one pair with X and Y. Y responsible for sex differentiation. God took a somatic cell, removed Y chromosome and cloned X to create it. 
all women have X chromosome in their cells, including Mary. Mary and the virginal conception. How to look at it? Was it a case of parthenogenesis? Parthenogenesis means Parthenos virgin, Genesis creation. It is a natural form of non-sexual reproduction in which growth and development of embryos occur without fertilization. Parthenogenesis occurs naturally in invertebrate animal species such as nematodes, water fleas, scorpions, aphids, mites and bees as well as a few vertebrates such as fish, amphibians and some reptiles. Parthenogenesis is not seen among mammals and definitely not among humans. A female with XX chromosomes can produce only a female through parthenogenesis. Let me repeat it again. A female with XX chromosome like Mary can only produce a female through parthenogenesis if it is possible. Mary would have begotten a girl if there was parthenogenesis. Jesus was a male, not a female. Fogelman had a different type of theology. Fogelman fostering Moravian theology wanted to consider feminization of Trinity, especially the belief that Jesus was a female. Parthenogenesis occurs naturally in some animal species such as aphids, nematodes, amphibians, fish, say for example Amazon molly, bees and scorpions and reptiles. Now, Jesus, the son of God, was a male. If Jesus was born of parthenogenesis, then the divine agent, the Holy Spirit, would not have his part in the conception. Then Jesus cannot be considered as the son of God. Jesus was born as a man, a male. He was circumcised on the eighth day. When we read Luke's Gospel, second chapter, 21st verse, we understand it. Female circumcision, called as female genital mutilation, FGM, is found in Africa, Asia and the Middle East, but not among the Jewish people. According to Hebrew Bible, circumcision is required for male Jewish children in observance of God's commandment to Abraham. Genesis 12 chapter 72 verse. Female circumcision was never allowed in Judaism, according to the Oxford Dictionary of the Jewish religion. D.D. D. Buff states, any form of female circumcision would be considered as bodily mutilation and are forbidden under Jewish law. Now, scientific understanding of the virginal conception of Jesus. When God created Eve, she had XX chromosome in her sex chromosome. Mary as a woman had X in her egg. During the conception of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit hovering over Mary placed Y chromosome in her egg that contained one X and a male child Jesus was born. It was not a sexual act, it is a creative act. When I said it is a creative act, a question can be there. Was not Jesus the only begotten son of God? Was he created? If you read Hebrews 10 chapter verses 5 to 7, there the word of God says, When Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body have prepared for me. Behold, I come to do your will. I would say that a body was prepared in the womb of Mary and the co-existent eternal Son of God came to dwell in it. He retained all the divine characteristics and nature. It is a sui generis act. Prepare is katartizo in Greek meaning to perfect, complete and make on what he ought to be. When we look at the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the eternal Son of God and he had to come and be born as a man. And for that, your body was prepared. Your body was prepared. Mary had in her own egg, she had X chromosome, and the Holy Spirit, the Creator, He put one Y chromosome there, and a body, a male body, was created. Moving on, let me tell you something about some evidences about the XY chromosomes in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at the Shroud of Turin, Dr. Ian Wilson, Professor of Structural Biology, Chairman, Department of Integrative Structural and Computational Biology, California, said that there are blood droplets found on the Shroud of Turin, the grave cloth that was used to cover the body of Jesus during his burial, the blood group is AB positive. And Ian Wilson says that the DNA of the blood of Jesus revealed that it contained X and Y chromosome. Jesus was a male with Y chromosome. Now, did Jesus inherit the sinful nature from Mary? When I was teaching in a Bible college, when I was serving the Lord there as an academic dean, 
when I was talking about the virgin birth of Jesus, looking at it in a scientific manner, one student asked a question. When Jesus was born to Mary, can't we say that Jesus had the sinful nature inherited from Mary? According to the principles of genetics, when a male and female mate and a progeny is created, for the expression of some recessive or negative characteristics, it should be present in the genes of both the partners. If not, it will not be expressed. You would have seen albino children without pigments. They will be white and uh, even their eyelashes lashes will be white. You would have seen such children. They are born because their parents, both the parents had recessive genes. Mary as a human had sinful nature in her, but during conception it was the Holy Spirit who offered the Y chromosome and Mary's sinful nature was not expressed in Jesus. Genetically looking at it, it is the right way to understand it. Jesus as son of God had no sin, did no sin and knew no sin. He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Often it grieves my heart when some theologians in some biblical seminaries speak very negative things about the Lord Jesus Christ. They look at the Bible with their perverted cerebral understanding devoid of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Mary was the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. How to be a mother of the Lord Jesus Christ? In a different angle. Let me read to you from Matthew's Gospel 2 chapter verses 46 to 50. Matthew wrote, while he was still talking to the multitudes, while Jesus was talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched his hand towards his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. How to understand it? When we read St. Paul's letter to Galatians 4, chapter 19 verse, Paul expresses his birth pangs for soul winning. When he wrote to the church at Galatia, he says, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Disciples who do God's will experience this burden and birth pangs to win souls. Liberal theologians will never understand this. When real children of God, when real disciples of the Lord Jesus develop birth pangs to see incarnation of Jesus in the hearts of others, they are the mothers of Jesus Christ. They labor in birth, odino in Greek, meaning to feel pains of child labor, to travail. This is what happened in the life of St. Paul, who was breathing out threats and murder. He became a soul winner. He told these people that he was laboring in birth again until Christ is formed in, in you. He spoke to the people at Galatia. Let me just share a testimony that I have. When I was 22 years old, the Lord Jesus came into my heart and I was born again. When the incarnation of the Lord's word came into my heart, I was given deep burden to pray for souls and guide them into the love of Jesus Christ. From that day till today, all these 52 years, I have been a soul winner. I pray for people, try to guide them to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. After my salvation, when I looked at my parents and my brothers and sisters, I understood that they were in need of deeper touch of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were believers, no doubt about it. They used to go to church and come, pray, read the Bible and all. But still I found something was deeply lacking in them. So I used to weep and pray for my parents and my brothers and sisters. Within one year, my parents came to know the Lord in a deeper way. My two sisters came to know the Lord in a deeper way. And for one sister, I prayed for 14 years and she accepted Jesus as the Savior. And for one brother, I prayed for 24 years and he came to know the Lord in a deeper way. My mother was a good mother. She was my teacher. She was my Sunday class teacher. She was the one who spoke to me about Jesus, the cross of Jesus. When I was around four or five years old, I wept at that time. I knew about it. But later when I came to know the Lord, I understood that my mother had to come deeper into the touch with the Lord Jesus. I used to weep and pray for my mother. Whenever I used to tell her some truth, she used to resist against me. I taught in the Sunday class, you are trying to teach me now. But one day, the Lord touched her. One evening when I was praying in the room, my mother stepped into the room and said, would you please pray with me? I prayed with my mother. She also prayed with tears. She came into deeper touch with the Lord. So I can construe and say that my mother brought me into the world. 
Chidi got me into this world. But after my salvation, God gave me great burden to pray for my mother. And I could say that I was able to pray and have birth pangs to bring Jesus Christ into my mother's heart. When my mother died, I did not cry. Because when she died, she went to be with the Lord Jesus in heaven. Now, dear friends, moving on, let me tell you something about the need of the hour. The need of the hour is incarnation. John's Gospel, first chapter, verses 1 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only begotten Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We need to obey the Word of God and be filled by the Holy Spirit for incarnation. Certain things we may not fully understand. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, Secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of God. We are exhorted by the Lord Jesus Christ to search the scriptures so that we will find him there. We need the help of the Holy Spirit to understand the word of God. The virgin birth and the incarnation are not cosmic confusions and not accidents in the divine plan of salvation. It was the result of divine creative thinking, eternal thoughtfulness of the creator God. The need of the hour is incarnation, but what we see in the ministerial parlor is there is excarnation. In archaeology and anthropology, the term excarnation, also known as defleshing, refers to the practice of removing flesh from organs of death before burial, leaving only bones. This concept of excarnation is opposed to incarnation. The word of God becoming flesh is not there. Even some theologians and the postmodern world is involved in digitization, digitalization, disengagement, disconnection, disembodiment, and continue to perform excarnation of the truth of God. Scholars like Michael Frost and Charles Taylor speak of excarnation happening in the church and the ministry. The need is to incarnate the body of the Lord Jesus Christ in an age of disengagement. Believers' life should reflect the incarnational style of Jesus. What is often seen? Separation of grace and truth. Replaced by lies resulting in division. Excarnation happens in Christian lives and also in many ministries. In many TV programs, the truth and grace are not seen. Instead, lies and vain images are shown. And so, not incarnation, only excarnation happens. What is our responsibility? As I said, John declares about the word becoming flesh dwelling amongst us. So let us be careful not to engage in excarnation, but long for incarnation. Let us love the truth, live the truth, speak the truth, and if needed, die for the truth. Let me repeat it again. Let us love the truth, live the truth, speak the truth, and if it is needed, die for the truth. Dear friends, may the Lord Jesus help all of you to receive him into your own heart if you have not done so. Let there be incarnation, not defleshing and excarnation. When the Lord Jesus comes into your own heart, he will pour into your heart compassion for souls. You would be in a position to reach out to other people, bring them to Christ. You can be construed, you will be considered as a mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you will be begetting children for the Lord. You will be gathering souls for the Lord with birth packs, with, with real compassion in your own heart. May the Lord bless you. Amen.